Morning, everyone. Nice to see you all. Nice to be with you. Someone suggested to me that um, a tough gig this week to follow the brilliant preacher of last week. Sandra did well, didn't she? Um, it's always nice to be able to be given the privilege of uh, opening the Word of God. We're continuing this series um, on, uh, on Acts to the ends of the earth. And uh, similar to what Sandra had last week, I think she had three or four chapters. We've got three or four chapters uh, uh, this week that we're dealing with too. Um, I just want to concentrate on a couple of passages. And they're the passages that Trudy just read out to us. The theme here today is about conflict and division. And how do we deal with that? Conflict in the church, division in the church, and its inevitability, but... More importantly, how did the first church deal with it and how do we deal with it as a church when it comes? Not to, suge not to suggest that uh, we're in the midst of it at the moment, but you know what? Where there's people, there's going to be problems. And where there's people, there's always conflict because we're human and uh, it, it often happens. So I think it's a very good thing for us to, uh, uh, to look at. The two passages you, you can see there that we're dealing with is uh, firstly... Uh, the disagreement, Acts 15, and then uh, what I call the midnight moment, what happens when Paul and Silas uh, are in jail. But we'll come, back, we'll come back to that. I don't know about you, but I, I, um, I hate's a strong word, but I think it's right when I talk about conflict. Personally, you know, I'm a lover, not a fighter. I, I, I don't like conflict, and whenever I see conflict coming... All I want to do is I just want to run. Um, psychologists talk about the, the fight or flight um, uh, response to conflict. That you can either stand there and fight the conflict or you can just get up and run. I'm a runner. Let, let, me, let me give you an example of that. Wednesday night at our place, it's bin night. We're sitting down. We've just had a meal, beautiful meal cooked by Sandra. And we're sitting there, we're watching a show on TV or something like that. And sometimes she will just say to me, are the bins out? Well, I'm up from that seat. I'm out the back door. I'm like Spider-Man around the side of the house. I get, grab the yellow bin in the left hand, the red bin in the right hand. I leap the seven-foot gate like you've never seen before in your life. I place them in the gutter and I come back in. I sit down and she doesn't even know I've done it. Why? Because I hate conflict. I will do anything to avoid conflict, which is very strange considering my vocation and considering the last maybe 12 or 13 years. Uh, Sandra mentioned something last week. Um, she said that uh, uh, last, last week at Soul Food, we had, we had a little bit of a conflict there. And it was not an internal conflict, it was an external conflict. It was someone outside of the Salvation Army that, that had a few little issues uh, uh, about soul food. And uh, you know what? I lost a lot of sleep that week over this. Why? Because I love soul food. I love that community. I'm very protective of that community. All of a sudden I saw the thing that I loved and the thing that I really believed God the Holy Spirit was guiding us to do under threat. That causes conflict, doesn't it? When you see things that you love under threat. And uh, what I didn't realise was that my, my small group, of which I didn't attend on Wednesday night, they prayed for soul food. They prayed for the conflict. They prayed for me. And the very next morning, I got a phone call that uh, went a long way towards... Uh, resolving that conflict. I wouldn't say it's completely resolved, but you know what? I slept well on Thursday night. And so you see the resolution, the resolution of conflict is so important for us. This is the theme that's going through these chapters. What do we do when there's conflict? And the example of Paul is this. Paul turns to the sovereign God who called him. Whenever in conflict, Whenever there is division in the church, he focuses on the one who called him and he focuses on the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to be looking at um, this morning. 
The first chapter, as I said, outlines a disagreement between Paul and Barnabas. The second chapter, we look at Paul and Silas in prison and the response of the Philippian jailer. And I've called this, as I said, the midnight moment. We see in these chapters uh, a series of conflict. And there's a couple of other, others in, uh, in 17 and 18 that we don't have time to have a look at this morning. Um, things such as injustice, unwanted circumstances, hostility towards evangelism. Each of these obstacles threatened the early church and dare I say they threatened the church of today in different ways. And they could have caused Paul to stop the expansion of the mission. I thank God that Paul wasn't like me and he just didn't run away from the conflict. But through all the hurdles and the troubles, Acts shows us the God who is above all. The God who is above all. Worshipping him is always the right way to move forward. Let me, let me be honest and transparent here. Um, 20 years ago, I can't believe it's 20 years, since Sandra and I were appointed here as the core officers. Can you believe it's 20 years? Lynn, you don't look any different. <laughs> I do. When we came to this church, um, and I'm being really honest and transparent here, it was a difficult time. We'd, we'd gone through some division. We'd gone through some conflict. And it was, it was hard. It was a difficult time for everyone. Some people had left. It was a difficult time for them too. It was a difficult time for some who remained. But when I look back now, I see that everybody that was involved there just determined that we would just allow God to heal. That we would never take our eyes off who we were in Christ and that we would always focus on who we were as the people of God. That was not always that easy. But God was faithful. And I thank God for who we are today as a worshipping community. Every relationship is going to have its conflicts. Every relationship is going to have its moments. Whether it's a relationship between friends at school or colleagues at work or a married couple or a um, a boyfriend and girlfriend, or whether it's the relationships within a church and a worshipping community, there are always going to be conflicts. And those conflicts will always threaten to divide us. It has to be in the church and in the body of Christ that we always focus on who we are as the people of God. There could always be things that, uh, that we agree to disagree on. I I was thinking about this the other day and I was trying to think of an example. I couldn't think of an example, so I'll make one up. I'll talk about Mark because he's not here. (laughs) I was thinking, what if Mark came to me and said, you know what, David, I want to completely change everything that you do at Miranda. You're you're doing this, this and this. I want to throw all that out and I want to do this, this and this. You know, what would my reaction be to that? Well, I... (laughs) I, I would strongly disagree with him because I believe that what we're doing is, is, um, is in line with the, the Spirit of God and what the, what, what the mission of the Salvation Army is. Why would I sit down with Mark and talk that through? Because despite the fact that Mark and I have differing personalities, despite the fact that Mark might think that we need to go in this direction and I think we might need to go in this direction, despite the fact that there are many differences between Mark and I, there is one thing that brings us together and that's the unity of the Spirit of God and that's the blood of Jesus that has set us free from sin. That's the thing that binds us together and that's the thing in conflict that we as the church and the body of Christ have to remain central on. That's the thing that makes us one. And when we don't allow that to be our focus, then the conflicts are going to cause division every time. We have to focus on who we are in Christ. So this first passage that Trudy read to us, Acts 15, 36 to 41, Here we see a disagreement between 
Paul and Barnabas. In fact, in my Bible, the heading on this passage says, Disagreement between Paul and Barnabas. A little bit of, little bit of background here is that uh, Sandra talked last week about the, the first uh, missionary journey of Paul. And it was Paul and Barnabas that went on this first missionary journey. Barnabas took with him another guy called John Mark. And uh, Paul had some issues with John Mark because uh, John Mark deserted them when they were in Pamphylia. And Paul didn't take too kindly with this. So Paul and Barnabas had this disagreement about John Mark. Paul is getting ready for his second missionary journey to uh, uh, Syria and Cilicia. And Barnabas wants to bring John Mark, but Paul says, you know what? He deserted us in Pamphylia. I'm not too keen about him coming again, and uh, I think we just need to part ways. So they have a disagreement. They part ways. And um, Barnabas actually takes John Mark to, um, to Cyprus, and Paul selects Silas to go with him on the second missionary journey. And uh, Phyllis, where's Phyllis? Phyllis, you love a map? I've got a map for you. There we go. There's the map. She told me she loved the map. The best part about Sandra's sermon last week was the map. No, it wasn't actually, and she didn't say that. <laughs> I'm getting everyone in trouble today. So there, there you see, I won't go through that, but that's the second missionary journey of Paul, and there we see um, that Paul has taken uh, Silas with him this time, and this is what we're dealing with now in these chapters, 15 and 16. How did Paul handle this conflict between him and Barnabas? He practised what he preached in Romans 12, 18, which says this, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now, there's a couple of words there that I always grab onto in conflict if it is possible. It is not always possible. It's not always possible to get peace in the midst of conflict. It's not always possible to resolve something in the way that you want it to be resolved because quite often the other person wants it to be resolved in a different way. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Paul's focus was not on the disagreement with Barnabas. He did not allow himself to become consumed with the conflict. Rather, he focused on the preaching of the gospel and giving the glory to God. Often, we don't want peace in an argument. We just want our way. We want to get even. We want to get back at those who hurt us, even if they are our brothers or sisters in Christ. Louis Giglio says that conflict tends to turn us inward, dividing us and slowing the spread of the gospel. It's true, isn't it? When there's conflict in the church, it slows down the purpose of the church. And sometimes it completely halts the spread of the gospel. And that's exactly what Satan wants. But it's not what the Holy Spirit wants or God wants or God called us to. Therefore, creating peace in the church is a way to obey God and expand his worship throughout the world. Yes, Paul parted ways with Barnabas, but he continued the mission that God had given him to preach the gospel of Jesus. He continued to focus on the mission of the kingdom. There are many issues that threaten to divide the church internally. However, we must always focus on the unity we have in Christ to maintain peace. Division and conflict are inevitable when all the focus and energy is on us and not on Jesus. That's true, isn't it? Conflict and division is inevitable when all the energy is on us and not on Jesus. So let's move on quickly. We go to the next passage in, uh, in 16, chapter 16, around about verse 13. We see Paul and Silas on their way in the second missionary journey. And they find themselves at a place called Philippi and down in the river at Philippi, by the river. Sandra and I have been there. Many of you may have been there too if you've been on the footsteps of Paul. I see Robin and Howard uh, nodding. It was our great privilege to, to lead our tour group 
in devotions at the river at Philippi. And it was by this river that the first convert in Philippi, Lydia, came and was baptised there by, by Paul and Silas. And Lydia was, um, was a businesswoman in, in Thyatira. She was a dealer in purple cloth, and because it was purple cloth, there, there were usually very, very prominent and noble people that uh, she, she was uh, selling the cloth to. And so she was a very prominent person to be baptised and to believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so uh, it was here that she was baptised, and then she invited Paul and Silas back to her place. They met her family, they had a meal with her family, and her entire household, as scripture tells us, were brought to Jesus and were baptised in the faith of Jesus Christ. The next day, Paul and Silas are walking through uh, the villages of Philippi, and they come, up, they come across a, uh, a young slave girl who is possessed with a spirit. And Paul, uh, after a while, recognises the need to cast this, this spirit out of this uh, young slave girl and in the name of Jesus, be free, he says. The spirit left her, but her, employee, her employer was not very happy with what had happened because he felt that this was going to threaten his business and the business of other people in the area. And so he called the authorities, and the authorities came, and they arrested Paul and Silas, and they threw them into jail in Philippi. There are ruins there in Philippi, and I've actually... I've actually stood there and looked at this jail cell that may have been the jail cell. When you go on these tours, the tour guide often uses the words, this may have been the place where Lydia was baptised. This may have been the jail cell. And so I've stood there at the place that may have been the jail cell and it's like this wide, this long. And uh, so Paul and Silas are here in jail. And then comes the crucial moment. It's midnight. And you'll see this in the passage here. It's midnight. Here's Paul and Silas in jail. They have their, their hands and their ankles in stocks. They've been whipped. They've been flogged. You could just imagine how they were feeling physically. You can only imagine how they were feeling Emotionally and spiritually, they must have been absolutely, really, really devastated in so many ways. And yet, what do they do at midnight? They sing. They sing hymns, they pray, and they praise the God who served them. What was their response to that conflict? Worship. Worshipping the God. I don't know about you, but I think I probably would have just... Um, had a little bit of a pity party and given up. I thought, you know what? The proclamation of this gospel is not worth it. I don't know that I could go on with this. And yet Paul holds fast to the God that called him. And he stands firm in the gospel and he worships. That's his response to conflict and hardship. They didn't give up on following God. They recognised that although their circumstances had changed, they still worshipped a God who had the power to transform their situation. I love verse 25 here. It says, And all the prisoners were listening. When they were singing hymns and praising God, all the prisoners were listening. What happened next is a miracle. Let me remind you of this very, very quickly. They're singing hymns and praying and praising God. Then there's a violent earthquake that shakes the prison foundations. All the prison doors fly open. Everyone's chains come loose of all the prisoners and fall on the ground. The jailer draws his sword to kill himself. Paul assures him no one has escaped. The jailer asks... What must I do to be saved? And Paul responds, believe in the Lord. The jailer then washes their wounds, invites them back to his household, and his entire household is baptised. 
invites Paul and Silas back to his house for a meal. He was filled with the joy of the Lord and the next day the magistrates release Paul and Silas. This is the miracle at midnight. This is what Louis Giglio calls the miracle at midnight. It was a disastrous situation. It seemed like an impossible situation. Yet rather than have a pity party, they worshipped God. And the result was a miracle. Worship changed everything. When faced with conflict, what did Paul and Silas do? They worshipped the God above it all. Would the same outcome have occurred if they wallowed in their misery? No, definitely not, because they would have given up. They would have run. They worshipped the God above it all. They never lost sight of the one who had called them. I want to finish with this quote, and it's a quote from uh, Louis Giglio again. Before I read that, let me just say this, that following Jesus is all about him and it's all about the good news of the gospel that sets us free and it's the same gospel that set Lydia free that transformed the slave girl and the Philippian jailer and it's the same gospel that transforms you and I and Louis says this the God of the mountaintops is the God of the valleys and he is worthy of our praise today. It may not change our situation, but worship will change us in the midst of the situation. Life will not always be easy, even when we are focused on the mission of God, but the valleys of life often advance God's mission further than the mountaintop experiences. No matter where you are in life, no matter how things are going, God has not left you. Whether you are facing opposition or in the middle of conflict or at rock bottom or feel you are the wrong person to witness to those around you, look to the God who is above all. He is worthy of your worship, your obedience and your courageous faith. Trust Him and see what He can do in your midnight moment love that we all have midnight moments maybe you've got a midnight moment right now maybe you're at this crossroad of uh, do I hang in there because sometimes when it's really tough the last thing you feel like doing is praying and and worshiping God and singing hymns of praise I know I've been there it's the most difficult thing to do when you need it most but it might be your midnight moment right now. And so all we're going to do right now is we're going to worship. And so wherever it is that you've got in your life that you might consider as conflict or as a midnight moment, you know what? It's 11.59, you have to make a decision. Do you run or do you turn to God? I want to encourage you to do the latter. Turn to the one who's called you, the one who can lift you and help you through these midnight moments right now. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. You search me deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. So let's do that. In the midst of the midnight moment and everything else that's happening, let's focus on him and worship on him. Father God, we worship you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for this calling on our lives individually and as the body of Christ. And we know that conflict will come. We know that division will threaten. But we just reach out to you. We lift our voices in praise and worship to you this day and we thank you for who you are and we ask for a miracle to be done in our midnight moments and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.